All is right in the world once again with my good buddy, smiling face in the house, Ryan Talbot. Had a night off last night. Voice is a little bit uh, under construction, but we got it back, uh, you know, enough to have ourselves a little show here tonight on the Wednesday edition of Shout a Buffalo Football Podcast, brought to you as always by Tops Friendly Markets. Right now, you can enter for a chance to win $1 million. Each week, Kings Hawaiian is pitting two city sliders against each other in the ultimate showdown, and you get to help decide the winner. Vote weekly for your favorite regional slider for a chance to win all season long and earn entries towards the $1 million prize. Explore the interactive stadium to play games, get recipes, share photos, and so much more. Visit topsmarkets.com slash red zone to enter. Welcome into the show, Ryan Talbot. Hey, hey, thank you. Went over to Tops, grabbed some uh, Lipton black tea and honey and uh, living it up (laughs) right now, trying to get that voice back. I love it. You know what I went over to Tops and grabbed? What'd you get? Oh, some honey crisp apples. Good Fresh honey crisp. I'm fully aboard the train. I'm about 68% of the way through this apple. So if you see me eating while Ryan is talking, I'll have my microphone muted because I'm not a rude animal. But I'm going to probably crush this. I haven't eaten since 12. I couldn't get dinner in before we started. So I think I'm going to have to crush the rest of this apple while we're doing this. Is, is that Do you think that's rude? I don't know. Hey, you've got to eat at some point, right? There you go. All right. Let's get started. We have a lot to get to tonight. Setting up the show a little bit. A lot happening at One Bills Drive. It was a frenzy, a media frenzy, if you will. It's almost like you didn't know where to go. Start off the, you know, obviously getting out to practice, seeing Naheem Hines, Dean Marlowe back in the Bills uniform, uh, a lot going on there. But once we got to the open locker room portion, you know, Josh Allen, Von Miller, Naheem Hines comes to the podium. And right before he's he's ready to, you know, get over there and, and the PR staff was going to go get him. Trey White just starts an impromptu media session. It's the first time, Ryan. We, we did yeah. the math. It's the first time we've heard from Tredavious White. I'm pretty sure going back to before week one last season, because you remember the COVID was still going on. He wasn't doing um, weekly press conferences at the time. And I think he just was, you know, getting, um, di- getting things dialed back up a little bit. So uh, this was literally the first time we've talked to Tredavious White in probably, I don't know, maybe like 16, 17 months. Yeah, it's pretty wild. And, you know, he opened up about a lot of things, the physical part of the rehab, the mental part of the rehab. So uh, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about the story that you have up on the site? Yeah. um, So it really was, you know, it it almost felt like it was the build up to him talking about this. And a, a lot of it came down to the process of all this when it first started and he suffered the injury and it happened at a horrible time. I mean, if you remember back then, even despite the up and down struggles they were going through, this was a team with Super Bowl aspirations. And, you know, to to go to be pulled from all of that when, you know, it happened right at the Thanksgiving game, obviously they was coming off a high of that big win in New Orleans. I think it kind of, you know, set him back a little bit. He said after the injury, as he was kind of going through the process of deciding what he was going to do and where he was going to have the surgery and where he was going to do the rehab, he literally, um, you know, people from the facility, you know, trainers the, from the training staff had to go to his house and drag him out of his mm-hmm. basement uh, to get him to kind of, you know, snap out of it a little bit and, and uh, you know, face the rehab. And he talked about, you know, over the course of time, there were some bright moments and some dark moments, right? Like going through the everyday process. And also, you don't really think about this. Like your life is so consistent for so long. Like he talked about playing football and basketball and track growing up. And then obviously college and the pros focusing on football, but your life's so much centered around that. It's almost like maybe an identity crisis when all of a sudden it's ripped away. You don't have that, that football part of it anymore. Um, I think it was something that, you know, he, he dealt with. There was some, some um, bright moments as well. He got to spend a lot of time with his children, which, you know, he's spoken about this in the past round. We talked about it on the show. You know, he kind of lets his wife kind of, or um, his girlfriend kind of take over the, the, the being a parent, a full-time parent during the season. So he can, you know, break down film and study, study tape, everything. And this allowed him to kind of be, be dad, go, go to school, pick up the kids, you know, play hide and go seek around, around the house once he got off of his crutches. So really like a cool 
uh, side piece to this that, you know, he really embraced. Yeah. You know, first and foremost, the identity bit, it, it's interesting because I know a lot of people that work in the same job for 30, 40 years, and then they retire and, and they think it's something they're going to look forward to. And it's, well, what do I do now with all that extra time? Or what do I do? Because I'm used to that normal grind of working this job, doing the same thing. And, and it's not exactly the same, but I, I can kind of understand where Trey White's coming from because of people who have gone through that and their experiences talking with me. Uh, so with Trey White, he's used to playing sports. You said it in high school, in college, in, in the NFL, having that grind of, okay, football season. I'm kind of, I'm in the basement watching film nonstop. Uh, the, his girlfriend is kind of a single parent at that point, as he's alluded to before. Now, all of a sudden you're injured. You can't be out there on the field. You still want to uh, work obviously on, on some of the, the football aspect of it, the rehab, the process of getting back. But this allowed him to realize there's more to life than just football. And at some point in his career, uh, 10 years from now, maybe whenever it is, you know, that he'll retire, the game will be over. Uh, but this was nice for him. Like you mentioned, he got to play hide and seek with his kids. He got to spend a lot more time with them. So from that aspect, it was great. Uh, but I, I, I really appreciate the fact that he talked about the mental hurdles and the physical hurdles that he went through. Yeah. And getting himself ramped up, he's putting it all in the hands of the coaching staff, the training staff, how much he plays when he comes back to play. Like, you know, I think it was a big step today that the bills aren't ruling Tredavious white out for Sunday. And that gives you a chance. See how you go through the week of practice, put him in a lot of different situations, game situations, and then take it from there in game. Like, you know what, Ryan, they might go in and say, all right, he's passed all the tests all week long. We're ready to go. Get him in the game, line him up at left or right cornerback. Like, you know, you have in the past and let him ride for the game, right? That might be the plan. Then he might get out there and he might get through two series and be like, oh man, I'm not in football shape yet. So he might need right. a blow. And guess what? The good news is you have Kyer Elam, you have Christian Benford, uh, you have Dane Jackson. However, that rotation ends up working itself out. You don't have to be you know, hamstrung into a situation where you have to play Trey white. Um, you can go in and kind of let it play out the way you want it to. Yeah. And, and that's great. And, and the fact that he's willing and open to letting the training staff handle this, he's not pushing back saying, I want to be out there this amount of reps. Uh, that's the best thing for him and, and the best thing for the bills going forward in terms of figuring this out on the fly. I, I've heard a lot of bills fans saying they're concerned about him potentially playing at MetLife stadium on that field. Um, but you know, there's going to be certain fields throughout this year that eventually he's going to have to play on, whether it's at MetLife, whether it's at Soldier Field. Uh, each of them have their own ups and downs in terms of uh, why people don't like having players play on them for injury purposes. But if the Bills feel comfortable and if he feels comfortable, I, I would think it would be great to get him out there for a few series, like you said. Or um, The Bills, though, th they're so deep. Just talking about the, the roster right now, like you said, Christian Benford, Dane Jackson, Kyer Elam. Uh, and that's not all on the active roster. And then you reactivate a guy like Xavier Rhodes to your practice squad. So they're deep on their main roster. They have some options on their practice squad. They're getting Trey White back. If there's an area of strength all of a sudden, uh, one of the biggest areas of strength, it's suddenly cornerback where uh, a few months ago, Matt, we were talking about that being maybe one of the biggest question marks. Yeah, and, you know, it's funny – I don't think you ever really lose your swagger, even when you go through something like this. I think Odell Beckham Jr. is a perfect, perfect example of that. He came back, obviously, off of the struggles in New York, never worked out in Cleveland, had the, the first ACL injury, comes back, figures it out in, in, in L.A. and goes on to almost be the Super Bowl MVP, if not for another torn ACL. And, you know, OBJ was somebody that Tredavious White really leaned on during this process. He's one of the people. And obviously they have a relationship going back to LSU. And I think something – he even joked today that it's he's him and Jarvis Landry were why he switched over from being a wide receiver when he first got to LSU because he knew he was never going to get on the field. And he said, uh, you know, we focus so much on the Von Miller angle of um, the Odell Beckham recruitment. You know, White and Odell go back, you know, to 2013. I mean, that's a friendship that obviously, you know, White mentioned when he was talking about the rehabbing from the injury, but also something where his – part in the recruiting process, I think is important too. That's got to really energize Odell knowing that his brother, a guy that he went to war with at LSU, he's also coming back. They've kind of gone through this together in a lot of ways over the last yeah. nine months. And, and 
I think Trey White, you know, sent uh, Bills Mafia into a tizzy when he said that he sent about 2,700 uh, Bills emojis to Odell Beckham Jr. to try to recruit him over the last couple of months. Yeah, it's a great point, Matt. You know, you, you have Von Miller, who's guaranteed it two times over. You have Trey White, who has that relationship. And then you have Odell Beckham Jr. in terms of he has to make a decision probably in the next month, month and a half. Um in terms of where teams probably want to get him into the building, see where he's at, get him up to speed on the playbook and get him onto the field. So it's interesting because Albert Breer was recently talking about teams that have touched base with him and it was the bills. Uh, it had been the chiefs before they traded for Tony, the Buccaneers, the Packers and the Rams. And when you look at those teams, cause minus the chiefs after acquiring Tony, I wouldn't say that any of those NFC teams are the Super Bowl favorite or close to the Super Bowl favorite coming out of that conference. It's the Eagles. Um, There's a lot of questions about all three of those teams. Uh, I think of the teams that have touched base that Breer mentioned, the Bills are the biggest slam dunk in terms of, do you want to win another ring? Come here. Um, So when you have players recruiting, when you look at you want to win, when you have Brandon Bean today talking about, you'd be crazy not to at least look into it. There's a lot of signs pointing to, if the stars align, if the contract makes sense to both parties, I wouldn't be shocked to see Beckham Jr. here in a, in a month, month and a half time. You know, I don't think Beckham's coming back to cash a big paycheck at this point. No. I don't think, you know, there might be a team out there if it works out. I don't know the Packers situation. Maybe that's the kind of situation where, okay, I'll sign a two-year deal for big money and then get to play with Aaron Rodgers and I'll be the missing piece to what's going on in their offense. And listen, to play devil's advocate, listen, I watched the, the Packers up close and I thought I was talking about it in the media room today. I don't know how much, you know, he wants to go play in that offense without, you know, the, the same amount of playmakers that would be within Kansas City in Buffalo. But here's the thing, Ryan, the path to the Super Bowl is actually probably easier in the NFC, right? I mean, there's just not as much firepower, you know, especially now with Miami loading up and now all of a sudden being probably the third best team in the NFL. Um, I, I don't, I don't think he'd place any of the NFL or the NFC teams in that, in that role. So maybe that's the case, but there's not really a better landing spot. I don't think for Beckham in terms of role and opportunity in an offense to make a splash than with the bills, even with all the other players in their offense. Yeah, I, I think you said it perfectly, Matt, because if he wants to join a team where he has a chance to win the ring the most, the Bills make the sense based on the roster, based on the record, based on where they're at right now. But if if he wants an easier path, there's an argument to be made for one of those NFC teams because, you know, there's the Eagles and then there's everyone else in that uh, conference. Obviously, the Giants are a real feel-good story, um, but they're, they're playing above what they're, you know, what – they're not as good as their record indicates. Uh, Dallas, I'm still on the fence about Dallas as a contender in that conference. Uh, Tampa, Green Bay, their struggles we've talked about. San Francisco maybe can get something figured out after adding McCaffrey, but it, it's easier in that conference. So if he's looking for an easier path, maybe he does join an NFC team. Uh, but if he's looking for the best situation, the best roster, I think it has to be Buffalo. Couple uh, news and notes uh, from today: the New York Giants. Uh, Joe Shane and Brian Dable uh, claimed Isaiah Hodgins off of waivers. And with the Bills making a couple moves, adding Dean Marlowe, not get sending a player out. And then obviously the Hines for uh, Zach Moss uh, f- switch didn't have any impact on it. But then uh, Tredavious White getting added back to the 53-man roster. They needed to make a couple of openings. So the Bills released Brandon Bryant and Isaiah Hodgins, likely with the idea to try to get them back on their practice squad and We'll see about Brandon Bryant, but Isaiah Hodgins goes to New York where, um, you know, the, the the Giants just traded Kadarius Tony, and they had a, a spot open up, and this was always the kind of dangerous part with Hodgins, but it's just one of those things that even when he's played and had an opportunity, and it hasn't been a big one, it just there just hasn't been enough there. I think he was kind of in a similar boat to, to Zach Moss. All right, maybe you let them go, see what they can do elsewhere, and then maybe not close the door on, you know, getting back together later on, if it makes sense. No, that makes plenty of sense. Uh, Hodgins was just the odd man out in the numbers game. Uh, Even when they had a lot of injuries and he got activated and he got to play, he wasn't overwhelming. He he had some nice moments, but this is going to be a true opportunity for him to play on a regular, consistent basis with the Giants. 
Uh, they need that wide receiver help. Like you mentioned, they traded away Tony. Um, they've had some guys just kind of playing in bigger roles and week by week. There's been weeks where it's been Richie James. There's been weeks where it's been other players too. So I could see a, a player uh, like Isaiah Hodgins coming in, getting regular snaps, and maybe he's never going to be someone that leads the team in receptions in a game or yards, but I think he'd be a regular contributor and that's a better opportunity than what was presented to him here in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. couple of uh, injury notes here as we look at the Bills first uh, injury report of the week. And um, Sean McDermott said that Matt Milano is day to day with that oblique injury. Um, He was, A DMP today, so he didn't practice today. Uh, Taiwan Jones with the knee, but that's nothing new. He hasn't been practicing uh, and then has been has played the last couple of weeks. Jordan Poyer dealing with that elbow injury. He's in a day to day situation. Both him and Matt Milano are going to be like, are you going to probably watch it throughout the week? See where it's at uh, and then, you know, kind of see what happens. Von Miller uh, and Roger Saffold with uh, the vet day. Uh, Tremaine Edmonds popped up on the injury report today, Ryan, with a heel injury. Uh, we talk about that. And then Spencer Brown still dealing with that ankle injury. He was doing a lot of work off to the side, had a jersey on, which I think was a little bit of a change up. Still not uh, super involved quite yet. I don't know if they're in the they're, they're going to be overly trying to rush him back because I think Questenberry was fine. Uh, but, you know, a little bit bigger of an injury report here to start the week. Yeah, definitely a bigger injury report. But if you if you look at the Jordan Poyer news singularly, that's great news because he talked about waiting to get the MRI, but he heard, uh, you know, felt a pop. Um, you, you thought worst case scenario, that could be a week to week type of injury. So to ha- have Brandon Bean today say day to day, potentially, you know, maybe miss this Jets game, but could return for a, a big showdown with Minnesota and some of these bigger games that they have in the second half. I think that's huge for the Bills mm-hmm. um, because it was something where you were concerned about. You've lost Micah Hyde. Poyer you're missing time early this year. He gets injured again. Um, it's good news that at least it seems like a short-term injury for him. When it comes to Matt Milano, Matt Milano's been playing at an all-pro level, so uh, you can only hope that he'll be ready to go for Sunday. That linebacker crew uh, will would severely miss him if he could not play. Obviously, Edmonds on that injury list, too, is a little bit concerning. Uh, the, the Jets offense has not been good at all, but obviously you want to have a full arsenal on defense to really uh, continue those struggles, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, we can transition now a little bit. Uh, I want to get into uh, the Naheem mm-hmm. Hines story. I mean, there's so much to kind of dive into. Before we get to him, though, let's let's kind of put a bow on the Zach Moss era. We talked a little bit about this on the show last night. You weren't on there. So I'd be interested to to hear your thoughts. Was this something that you felt like was just inevitable and they needed to find a different situation? Or did you think that there, there was a path to some type of role for, for Moss? No, I I thought that the writing was on the wall. Um, He's been a healthy scratch the last two years at times. Uh, This year he was active this past week, but he didn't get any, playing time on offense. It, it was clear that the Bills had kind of phased him out of the offense. There wasn't a role for him. When they tried to make him that short yardage back, it just didn't work on a regular or consistent basis. And that's what he was supposed to be, that between the tackles, tough yard type of runner, uh, and, and it never came to fruition. So the Bills had kind of moved on from them, from him mentally, I think, in terms of how we're going to utilize this guy on a week-to-week basis. Well, we're not. And then when an opportunity comes along to add a back that you think you could uh, use in your offense and then part ways with him, it it just made way too much sense for the bills. Mm -hmm. You know what else makes sense, Ryan, Um, you know, heading over to tops and just getting after this Christmas bonus that they got going on right now. Tis the season to save on groceries and all of your favorite holiday gifts. And they, they got a combo for you shop at tops and save $10 at all your other favorite stores and restaurants with over 25 gift cards to choose from. There's something for everyone on your list. And don't forget to treat yourself to some extra savings too. save on great gifts like toys and games from GameStop or Toys R Us at Macy's great family dining at Applebee's or Buffalo Wild Wings. Get that new big, big screen TV you've always wanted from Best Buy and so much more just by shopping at tops. Be Santa's biggest little helper with Christmas bonus from Tops for a complete list of available gifts 
card savings. Visit topsmarkets.com slash Christmas bonus. All right. Naheem Hines. So a couple of interesting things to get into that came out today as we got a chance to sit down with Naheem Hines. Brandon Bean obviously talked about his acquisition. And this was something that, you know, C. Fitz in the comments asked, did, did Hines request a trade? And, you know, more or less, I don't know if he actually yes. went and, and yeah. made the, you know, the formal request, but he just felt that he had reached you know, the, the place in his career that, you know, it was just time for something new, a change of scenery. He had, he had kind of uh, outstayed his welcome. And it's, it's interesting because as that kind of, uh, you know, change of pace back behind Jonathan Taylor, there's a ceiling on really what you could do in that offense, right? Like unless Jonathan Taylor's out, it's hard for Naheem Hines in that role to really have an impact on games. And I think getting in a different situation where they can move him around a little bit, and we're going to get into that in a second. I think that was really advantageous for both sides. And, and the Colts are, they're not in a win now situation. As a matter of fact, they're right. going to start probably trying to stockpile draft picks. I think everybody that need that needed somebody should have been on the phone with them to try to get somebody. Um, but another thing Brandon Bean said about this that I thought was interesting. And I'm not surprised. This was not the first time the Bills checked in on Naeem right. Hines. Apparently, it happened in uh, 2020 during the COVID year, and then he checked in again this past offseason before ultimately you know, changing gears and going after J.D. McKissick. Um, so interesting. I mean, this, this is kind of like another move that was destined to happen for years. Yeah, and, and you know, going back to C. Fitz's question, I was watching a clip from the Pat McAfee show, and McAfee's pretty well in tune with the Colts organization. And he was talking today about how Hines pretty much wanted a fresh start. And he, he said he was ready to kind of move on. So you're right. He maybe he didn't make the formal request for a trade, but he let it be known that he was hoping to find find a new home, find a new spot. And I, I almost wonder if the Colts were, were going out of their way to honor that request because he didn't make a fuss. He didn't complain. He'd been so good in the locker room and in the community uh, that they tried to make sure that that took place. Um, so as for the bills though, I'm not shocked at all that Brandon Bean was able to get someone in here that he had tried to acquire before it's happened with Stefan Diggs, where he had called uh, a few times and then was able to finally get him Naheem Hines. It finally happens. They're able to get him. So he has those guys that he's like, I think this is going to be a good fit for this team, for this culture. Uh, and then he always circles back to them to see if they potentially become available. So, uh, good on him to kind of keep that up, keep checking in and, and, finally get the guy that he's been trying to get for a few seasons here. Mm -hmm. um, Heinz's role is something that we, we I think we got to dig into a little bit because I, I think that some of the things that Brandon said today and then, you know, following up with, with Heinz himself, it's really interesting about how this whole depth chart could look and how they choose to use him. I think that the bills, what they're telling you, with not only this move, but what Brandon Bean said today and, and talking so much as Hines about Hines as a pass catcher and even volunteering the idea of him in the slot uh, so much to the point where Brandon actually said, we think that he could play in the slot, um, you know, for a game if it, once he gets comfortable in the offense. So this is a situation where they are dead set on finding these positionless players um, and they can kind of deploy Hines in that way during games kind of a lot like I thought they wanted to try to do with James Cook but it's it's really clear to me that with Cook with Khalil Shakir they want to take a little bit more off these young players plates let them focus on just doing the basics of their job and let guys that have done it in this league veterans like Hines come in and have that kind of impact yeah so first and foremost with Naheem Hines uh, one thing Brandon Bean said today is we can let him be the punt returner Khalil Shakir, as you just mentioned, has done a really good job, uh, but he has a lot on his plate. He's learned still, you know, we want to get him more comfortable in the wide receiver role, the position there, potentially playing a bigger role in the slot. So Hines brings that experience as a punt returner. Two touchdowns in his uh, second season in the league, his first real year as a punt returner with the Colts. Uh, has been really good since then, 300 return yards the next year, averaging over 10 yards per return this year. He's going to be able to slide right into that role. In terms of the offensive role, you said it, positionless type of player. You can put him in the slot. You can put him in the backfield, give him a few carries. But obviously the, the thing he does best is catch the ball. Uh, and when he catches the ball and takes off with that speed, he shocks some people. You mentioned it. 
uh, that Josh Allen, Stefan Diggs both kind of looked and were like, holy cow, this guy is fast. He's faster than James Cook uh, in terms of the 40 time uh, that he recorded back at the combine of four, three, eight, I believe. So he, he brings another dynamic to this offense. I, I think that the bills right now, you know, listen, they want to win the super bowl this year. And I think that James Cook can help on offense to get to that point. But I think there's been wrinkles to this offense that maybe they haven't been able to implement yet because they thought that maybe it'd be too much for James Cook too soon. You bring in Hines, someone that has that experience, like you said, and all of a sudden you can kind of open up that playbook to maybe a few of those pages that you're trying to open up or unlock when you were going after J.D. McKissick, when you initially drafted Cook, and now when you finally get Naheem Hines. Yeah, and I think that there's gonna there, there's gonna be a limited amount of that playbook that's available to Hines early on. I mean, this is gonna take a real uh, you know cramming to get this playbook to to a place where he's confident and comfortable. And he said when he came in, it was like uh, like hearing Chinese at first, and by the time practice had ended, it felt like it was a little bit more uh, relatable. And Kelly Skipper, who's been around, you know, not only in for you know Sean's coaching staff, but he's coached a lot of different. Uh, running backs at different stages of coming into this system and this program and probably has figured out a pretty good way that works to get people acclimated pretty quick, especially veteran guys. Uh, and so, you know, they spent a lot of time together today at practice going over the playbook and uh, Hines actually specifically mentioned how important that was. So, you know, I do I expect him to be active on Sunday? Definitely. Do I think that he's going to have uh, a, a bunch of really – uh, impactful plays or going to be on the field for 50, 60% of the snaps? No, because I think they're still going to rely on Devin Singletary. And that's another thing I took away from hearing Brandon talk about. I think he finally admitted that, listen, the problem in this offense is what we've been saying for, for months is that, yeah. you know, you want to get a lather, you know, you want to build a lather for, for, for your, your, for your running back. It's going to get the ball. And what he means by that is you got to get them some carries, get some touches to kind of get them into the feel of the game, the mode of the game, kind of using the, the shaving uh, euphemism there. Like, you know, you know, build up a lather with shaving cream. That's right. Very, very creative from Brandon Bean. And so, you know, you, you in building that lather, it takes away touches and opportunities from other players. But I think in the role of Hines, the same thing they envision for McKissick in the summer and Hines, I think, is the the better version of that. I mean, if you look at this guy, Ryan, Naheem Hines is arguably, you know, a top three running back pass catcher of the last five years. I mean, he comes in, he brings 235 career uh, touchdowns. He has more receiving touchdowns than rushing touchdowns over the course of his career. So I think that maybe in this offense with Dorsey calling the plays and Josh Allen throwing him the ball, you might be able to really unlock him as a receiver. I asked him about that specifically today, and he said, I have a lot of confidence in myself as a, as a receiver because I win on my routes. And what does Josh Allen always talk about? You get open, you get separation. I will give you the ball. You go make a play. It sounds like a perfect fit. Just as Naheem said, Hines said it was today. Yeah. And, and I agree with that completely. I was watching some uh, highlights of Hines and he can catch it out of the backfield. He can catch the screen passes. He can catch it out of the slot. Uh, go downfield and make plays. I saw some really nice catches down the field too, down the sidelines. He can do a little bit of everything as a pass catcher. Uh, I think that that's going to open up some things on this offense and against the jets. Like you said, I, I don't think he's going to play the majority of the reps or have a huge role on offense, but maybe in the red zone, you put him back there and you let him run a route and maybe he gets open in the middle of the field or down the sidelines and he makes an impact scoring a touchdown in that way. Maybe he flips the field as a punt returner, but going to Devin Singletary, this is now undoubtedly the Devin Singletary show. And I, I feel like it should have been based on his performance the past few weeks, mm -hmm. the way he ran against the chiefs, the way he was running against the Packers, he's averaging four to five yards per clip. Uh, he looks good in that role when you give him 15, 17 type of carries. Now I, I'm going to ask you this, Matt, because it's, it's the one thing I didn't agree with what that Brandon Bean said today. He said, I don't think that the addition of Naheem Hines is going to take away from James Cook's role. I think there will be times where they can both be in the backfield. Like he said, like he mentioned, but if Singletary, you build up that lather with Singletary, there's only a few carries behind him and that might be split up between those two. And if you bring in Hines, you're bringing him in to catch the ball in this offense, which again, that's something that you wanted Cook to do. So 
I think that maybe out of anything that he said, that's the one thing I disagree with. Right. And I think that he's in a spot where he couldn't really say anything else because sure. it would be almost like, dunking on the rookie right like or yeah. downplaying the effectiveness that he's had to this point or maybe even making it a storyline where okay because of the ineffectiveness of james cook the bills felt they had to go out and trade for a running back and so and there's a side conversation to this and this has been apparent for weeks and brandon actually had a really good you know uh monologue that he started off with today to really take you through what happened the last couple of weeks with christian mccaffrey and Alvin Kamara. And he mentioned that with Kamara, it was just the scouts that were kind of doing their do due diligence. He wasn't even involved in the process. They had reached out to other, you know, contacts in the saints organization and the saints never even got back to them. So the report from Jake Glazer that came out that said that the bills were rebuffed in their uh, interest in Kamara. It was literally not even at the general manager level. And to his point, I think that really showcases how it, I know that what makes the the NFL engine run is these really like intriguing storylines and reports sure. of what could be happening behind the scenes. But, you know, Brandon Bean has said this multiple times. And, you know, when the bills are in on somebody, it usually doesn't get out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like over the course that you know, nobody knew about the Stefan Diggs trade before it happened. Really, nobody knew about the Naheem Hines deal until it happened. He said, at three up until three o'clock on trade deadline day, he thought the Bills weren't going to make a trade. You know, maybe right. for you know, maybe the D Marlowe one was was a little bit more, uh, you know, coming down the pike. But he did reach out to the Panthers on Christian McCaffrey as soon as he found out how much it was going to cost. The Bills were out because listen, there was a lot of variables to that. It was like the Panthers were going to have to take a lot of the money, I would imagine, and then obviously the draft hall wasn't something that Brandon Beans in the, in the business of of giving up that kind of draft capital, that many multiple picks for a position that really, when you get to the, the brass tacks of it, Ryan, there's not enough opportunity for the player you're trading for to have the kind of impact to make it worth three or four shots at a player on a rookie contract for four draft picks, Ryan, Brandon B could hit on two of those that end up becoming full-time starters. Yeah, that's the thing too. And the bills are at this point too, Matt, where, with their roster, with the amount of money that they paid Josh Allen, with the money they paid Diggs, Dawson Knox, Deion Dawkins, uh, players on the defensive side of the ball, they need those rookies. They need those draft picks to bring in players on those four, five-year contracts that are at that rookie scale wage that don't break the bank because you're already giving out a lot of that money to your premier player. So if you trade all those for another premier player, that eventually you either need to pay, like in the case of like the Dolphins trading for Bradley Chubb, um, it, it just kind of handcuffs you a little bit in terms of your development. And I get all about swinging for the fences, trying to win it all now, but you also have to keep that roster healthy, knowing that uh, those day three picks don't always pan out as much as the Bills have had success there. You need to have those day one, day two, early day three picks to make the roster uh, continue to work year in and year out. Uh, I want to play a little game here. Um, and this happened before the trade. Uh, but I think it's interesting because I want to have a conversation about the pecking order in the AFC now after all the trades. I mean, we talked so much yesterday about the deals for the Miami Dolphins made. Don't forget the Baltimore Ravens went out and traded for Roquan Smith, which is a massive, massive addition to their defense. That's going to free up, you know, Patrick queen to be that penetrator, that pass rusher that I think he's more built to be and allow Smith to play sideline to sideline. That defense becomes a little bit better, a little bit scarier. So I'd be interested to see what that looks like in four or five weeks. But I want to play a game. I'm going to go through Dan Hanzus, uh, NFL.com's power rank or uh, extraordinaire. I'm going to go through his power rank and see if we can kind of guess what it is before uh, we do. Um, but one note I want to make before hand, Ryan, how much do you think? I reached out to a contact at betonline.ag today uh he always sends us the uh oh yeah yep the uh odds the change and i said what did the super bowl odds change after the trade deadline what do you think how much did the odds change for the miami dolphins after they traded for bradley chubb and jeff wilson i already know this answer and so if, it's the, if it's the same 
zero because I, I uh, tweeted something yesterday. It was RG three saying, I think it was RG three saying that to like, Oh, they're, they're, <laughs> it's going to change their impact, their odds significantly. And then one of the betting sites literally shared, it might've been Caesar sports uh, plus 3000 before the trade plus 3000 after uh, and kind of one of those like inquisitive faces, like, what are you talking about? So it did not change the odds at all. So, yeah, I think that's really interesting. And you know, there's a comment in here from uh, C Fitz again, if Chubb is so great, why would Denver uh, ch- let him go? And I think that's a, it's a valid critique of the deal. It's one where, all right, so you're in Miami Dolphins giving up another first round pick. And listen, they've had a lot of them. They've done a, Chris Greer has done a really good job, job of accumulating assets. And it's led to really good players. I mean, the addition of Tyreek Hill, you can make an argument that it's on par with Von Miller as, you know, the most important offseason additions of, that any team made. I mean, right. the guy is on pace to have 2,000 yards receiving and break records. And so it, it definitely makes a lot of sense the way that they've attacked it. But with Chubb, the problem with that deal for me is it's an all-in move now that's a little bit of a, a, a risk because there's questions about the quarterback still. And I'm not talking about what he's done to this point. He's been elite i will i will agree with that he's somebody that i had a lot of questions about coming in he's had some elite games this season the problem is though it's a very small sample size and the weather is a change in ryan talbot and when the weather changes tua has not looked like the same player in years past and not to mention the fact teams are going to start to really dive into the tape and what has worked so well for them and try to take different things away and when he has to adjust that's where the problem is going to be. The thing with Chubb, going back to the question, is the problem for me why I wouldn't have made the deal. All the, because a, I don't think that the the Miami Dolphins are all in ready yet. But also, you're going to have to pay Chubb now. And if you think a he's going to stay healthy or b he's going to be the consistent kind of pass rusher that deserves a max contract, sure, go ahead. I just don't think he's he's answered the bell on both of those fronts yet. No, he is not. Uh, Chubb, you know, he has had a really good bounce back season. He's had some injury issues. He had an outstanding rookie year where he had double digit sacks. He is at five and a half sacks right now, I believe. Uh, been an impact player at times for the Broncos, but the injuries have been there. He's going to be looking for a big money type of deal. So now you're just adding another contract onto a roster where, okay, you paid Tyreek Hill big money. Tua's looked really good in this system. Are you going to eventually try to pay him? Jalen Waddle's the real deal. You're almost handcuffing yourself by adding these potent, these players at the deadline where you're giving up valuable draft capital as well, uh, and, and you're just paying a, a few players on both sides of the ball. So that's a concern. With Tua and the weather, We like you said, until we see otherwise, it's been an issue for him in his career. Uh, with the turnovers, with his overall play, Maybe this system will unlock something. And to your final point, uh, a few weeks ago when when the Dolphins played against the Steelers, it was Tua's first game back. They marched right down the field, scored a touchdown. Uh, I want to say they scored another touchdown in their second or I think their third drive maybe. But by the second half, the adjustments that Pittsburgh made on them, they had it figured out in terms of how to guard Hill, how to stop that offense. And they pretty much punted or turned the ball over every drive in the second half. So teams that have the personnel are going to be able to adjust on the fly. And then teams that are able to watch the film are going to come in with a really good game plan. Mm-hmm. You know, the thing that I, I think that the, the reasoning behind why you do make the deal for me is you have some talent there on the defensive line. I think uh, Chris, uh, Christian uh, Wilkins is a good player on the interior. They got some other pieces. Manuel Agba is there. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Jalen Phillips is a young guy that maybe you hope to unlock him a little bit more pairing him with, uh, Bradley Chubb. So there, the reason is sound, especially with the back seven that they have some really some talent, especially yeah. in the secondary. So I get it. I just think that there's so many questions, but listen, this is a year to year league. I mean, when the window seems open as much as it does right now for the dolphins, I think, you know, they feel like they could probably win in a lot of situations. And I think this also is really important with the two of this conversation is, you know, the bills getting that number one seed and forcing, you know, the chiefs and now the Miami dolphins to come through Buffalo. It's that's going to be a really important piece to this because 
we've seen what he looks like in December. And obviously that game would be in January, but it, it did not look the same as, you know, previous performances. Right. Yeah. Uh, Tua, especially if, if the bills win, um, you know, control of the AFC through the Super Bowl. If, if he comes to Buffalo, I think he would really struggle. You know, Mahomes would be a much different environment in, in terms of the atmosphere, the noise. Uh, I think he obviously has the arm talent and the, and the ability to make it work, but even he would have a lot more challenges, obviously, than what he's faced in his career because pretty much everything has run through KC to this point uh, since he's entered the league. So he hasn't had to face those uh, that adversity, so to speak. So let's run through these. Uh, so I'm looking at the at the power ranking. So you're gonna, I'm gonna basically the game is I'm gonna ask you to give me your power ranking r- rankings and see how closely it matches up to Hanzus, who I feel like a lot of people around the league figure they think of this as kind of like the the power rankings gospel, if you will. He does a really good job with it. Uh, I, I like listening to him on his podcast as well. So let's go with uh, number one. And actually, you've probably already seen this this week because you do that so, at the power of each post. Am, am I doing the AFC or am I doing the NFL as a whole? Let's do NFL as a whole. Number one. Ooh, you're challenging me here. Um, I'm trying to think because there's a few sites that have the bills at number two and there's a few that have them at number one. I feel like they this is one of the sites that have them at number one, though. It is. Buffalo okay. Bills number one. Number two. I would assume the Philadelphia Eagles. Boom. Three. Sorry, getting murky for me. Um, <laughs> Kansas City Chiefs. Correct. Four. I'm this is no it. change for Hanzus at four. So this has been multiple weeks now that this team is at number four. I'm just trying to think of records overall in each of the conferences. It's an NFC um, team. Ooh. Same division as the Eagles? Yes. Okay. I will go Cowboys then. Correct. Okay. Number five, up two spots. NFC Ravens. Oh, the no NFC. NFC team. Gosh, I keep thinking of the NFC as like this dumpster fire. I know. Um, And now he is a guy. This is a team that Hanzus, I think, is believing in based on what they could be more than what they've been 49ers. Yes. Okay. Which I get let me, real quick. If, if McCaffrey, you know, I don't think he's always going to have a game where he throws for a touchdown, run for a touchdown and uh, catches the touchdown pass. But if he does unlock that offense, you get Debo back. Uh, Iuke's been playing really well. You have Kittle. If Jimmy G can just be a decent game manager, I could see that. Number six, AFC right, team. I- I'll go back to Baltimore because that's who I was guessing for number five. Baltimore Ravens. Number seven, um, NFC team. NFC again. You're killing me here. Um, They're coming up on the Bills schedule. Oh, that would be okay. The Vikings because I mentioned them. And yep. They're six and one. Actually, I'm surprised they're not higher on his rankings. Okay. I mean, it, it's kind of like an amazing idea. And I, I think the idea of power rankings is you want to make sure that you're not you know, you know, flip flopping too much week to week based on what you think a team has done. You know, even if they lose, like how do they lose? How close was the game? What were the circumstances of the game? I think right. impact all of that. Um, but Minnesota Vikings have been a really good team. I think that that's going to be a really good game in two weeks. Number eight, AFC right. team. Is if he's doing it based on how he thinks they could be, maybe Miami. Oh, no. Okay, let me think. Let me think. I'm not going to go Cincy because they got whooped uh, by the Browns. Yeah, and they're in a situation where there's a, in a, a lot of clouds around the uh, Jamar right. Chase situation. Tennessee's been playing good football. Yep, Tennessee Titans 5-2. Okay. and two. The Titans will not die, Ryan Talbot. No, it they is won't. amazing. And, you know, that game on Sunday was ugly. The rookie threw uh, attempted ten passes in the entire thing, yeah. but they still found a way. I mean, Henry, yeah, just because Derek Ren- Henry just plus. broke off two hundies, you know, so like no big deal, like no, yeah, no, no big deal at all. Number nine is a new participant, a new addition Ooh. to the top ten NFC team. NFC new addition. They are giving, you know, they gave Brian Dable a bad day last week, and now they're in the top ten. Oh geez, who was that that they played? Now they got they crushed them. Oh, Seattle. Okay, Seattle. Yeah. I was gonna say their quarterback Gino. probably doesn't do 
high knees for four hours. No. What a what a good story though for Geno Smith. Seriously, even it, it is a even cool if this sinks down at some point. I mean, I thought that was gonna be the worst team in the league this year, and they have looked nothing like the worst team in the league. Number 10 AFC. Miami. No. Ooh. Chargers? No, no. they're no. All right. Who is who's number 10? The Cincinnati Bengals. Okay. Down five spots. So you know, obviously a huge dip down because of the Jamar Chase situation, how bad they looked against the Browns. Right. Uh, but obviously still a believer enough if Chase is able to come back uh, that he's kind of holding out hope for them, I guess. Yeah, Number I 11. Guess he was on crutches, wasn't he, today? Yes. Chase? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that doesn't mean he's not going to be back anytime too soon, I suppose. Uh, I'm going to stick. I'm going to keep saying the Dolphins until it's right. Uh, no, NFC team. Oh. All right, uh, ooh, not Atlanta. I wouldn't think Atlanta. I'm trying to think of like records in that conference. They, I know they, they had an addition this week, not a trade deadline addition, but it could be one that puts them over top. Uh, it's a wide receiver, hasn't played a lot of games in the NFL, but um, you know, I think some Bills fans would tell you that you know he could be a, a real player at some point. His name's Isaiah Hodgins. <laughs> oh, the the G-Men. The G Men, the G Men oh. at eleven. Down five high. spots from number six. The, the which I, I get it because of their overall record. I still think that's way too high. I, I love the story. I love how they've played for them. The talent, the overall talent's not there for them to be that high. Number twelve, Miami. The Miami. Oh my goodness! Opens. Up two spots from fourteen. So obviously, you know they're working their way back up from that like middle of the season slog. Number 13 right. is wild, and 14 is wild as well, but I guess it's got to be because of the records. Falcons, one of them? No, 13 Patriots, yeah. 14 Jets, and again, okay. five and three, I get it. Uh, Rams at 15, Chargers at 16. I guess long story short, the the, ac- the reason for this exercise, I'm I'm really – trying to think this through whether or not the giants have passed. I think, or the, uh, the dolphins have passed the Ravens. I think definitively the dolphins, I consider them to be better than the Bengals. I know that there's a playoff experience, but I think right now in terms of who you fear playing more, and I think you make an argument that Cincinnati's defense is better than Miami's. We'll see what it looks like with, with Chubb bucks. Uh, Charles is asking for bucks, uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. All the way down, 17 Saints, 18 Falcons, 19 Packers, and 20 Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So it's a tough Wild. time to be a Tom Brady fan. Um, I'm just trying to figure out. I still have the Bills. I still have Miami. After that, like, I know they're five and three, but I think you can make an, uh, the case that knowing what we know about Lamar Jackson and that offense struggling in postseasons past. We've seen enough of explosive offense from Miami that I think I'd put them over them. If we're doing a power rankings based on who's a contender in the AFC. Hmm. I see where you're coming from. So obviously, okay. I think you misspoke when you said bills and dolphins, you meant bills and chiefs, right? Oh yeah. Sorry. Bills chiefs. Right. And then bills who's and the chiefs. team after that, when we're talking about the contenders of the AFC. So right now, Hanzu has the Bengals and the Ravens above the Dolphins, where I think I'd put the Dolphins over both of them at this point. Right. I'm trying to think of which team I would I would go with. This is actually tougher than I anticipated. I obviously fear Hill and Waddle more than Andrews and, and Lamar as a passer and runner. Um, but they can't be healthy at the receiver position. I mean, right. Debbie. Debbie Bateman Duvernay gets, down, was hurt last Duvernay. year. Bateman's been out. It's too much. I mean, they can't stay healthy, and I don't think that they have enough weapons when fully healthy around Lamar, especially when you get to the playoffs. Yeah, it's just what when Lamar is on, they're so dangerous. It's just mm-hmm. that, like you said, in the postseason, up until when they beat the Titans uh, a few, you know, recently, they hadn't had much success there. So. Yeah, I, I think I would probably lean the Dolphins right now as that third team just because of the defense. It's legitimate. Um, 
in, in terms of their their play, the players that they have, we we've seen some duds from them. Don't get me wrong. The Lions put up a lot of points on them recently. There's been a lot of points scored against them in some of these matchups. Um, but the talent is there for that unit to come together uh, up front on the back end. And then on offense, I, I really do like what they've been doing. Right now, the season ends today. Here's your playoff picture. Number one seed Bills at six and one. Number two, Tennessee Titans. They won't go away. Five and two. Chiefs, five and two. Baltimore, five and three. Jets five and three, Miami five and three, and the Chargers four and three. So you'd be looking at first round matchup of Tennessee Chargers, KC Miami. So you'd have Mahomes against Tua. To me, I think that that is the if you're a, if you're a Bills fan, the best case scenario that yeah. the Miami Dolphins play the Chiefs first round. Yeah, because one of those teams will get knocked out, obviously, and maybe the other one could potentially come to Buffalo. Whether uh, I think it would probably be the – well, it depends on how the other game shook out, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of them would come the next week or the following week in the – you know, uh, down the road. So it's interesting in terms of the scenarios. Now, obviously, I think the seating will change between now and the end of the season. But you're, you're right. Some of these teams that I – you know, I wrote off the Titans at one point. I, I said I think they can make the playoffs based on how weak their division is, but I didn't believe in them. They're playing solid football. Um, Vrabel does a really good job week in, week out to get that team ready. Henry's still Henry, even coming off of an injury last year that took him out for a few weeks. Um, th- they're just a solid team that they don't scare you on, you know, on paper. They don't scare you when you, you see them in some of these games, but they can do enough to win. So I think they'll be in the mix still at the end of the year. I think the, uh, the jets obviously will fall off. The offense is nowhere near good enough to be playoff worthy in my opinion, but time will tell. Um, what let's, let's do one last question. Then we're going to sign off here. Um, right now you got new England at eight, Cincy nine, Indy 10, Cleveland 11, Denver 12, Vegas, 13, Jacksonville, 14, and then Pittsburgh and Houston. What is the team outside of the playoff picture right now that you feel like is going to be a playoff team? By the time it's done. Can you read me the nine and 10 again? Uh, Cincinnati, Indy, New okay. England with eight, Cleveland, Denver, Las Vegas, and Jacksonville. I would go with two teams from the same division. I'd go Cincy and I'd go Cleveland. Okay. Uh, Cleveland. They, I know they've lost quite a few games here um, without Watson at quarterback, but they've also hung around every, almost every single game. The running game is, is legit. They didn't get rid of Hunt, so you still have Chubb. You still have Hunt there. You're going to get Watson back, and and you know as much as he is going to be vilified wherever he travels around the league, he is a significant upgrade on paper from what they have at quarterback now. And I mind you, it's been uh, a few years since he's played an actual meaningful game, so maybe there'll be some rust there. Um, but I could see them making some noise, and then the Bengals. You, you know, I, I think that. Uh, even though they still have some woes on their offensive line, I still believe in Joe Burrow. I still think they have enough talent on offense that they can kind of get back into the playoff picture. I I really want to say the Raiders because I just think they have too much talent not to. Like I think Josh Jacobs is having this amazing season, and there's no way that the way that their car performed last season, that adding Devontae Adams should be this horrifying to watch. Um, Mm -hmm. I think you put a lot of that on the plate of of Josh McDaniels. I tweeted it. I I stand by it. I know a lot of people, you know, respond to that calling Derek Carr trash. And listen, I I get it. He's not been good. And there's, he gets a big chunk of this as well, but you know, he's had success in other systems and Josh McDaniels has been the head coach that wherever he's been offensively, it has not worked as a head coach. So to me, I'm placing more of the blame on that. And just because of how bad it's look looked, I'm just like, I don't know. I was thinking about toying with the idea of Denver because of how good their defense is and if, if Russ can just be average. But, man, do they got a stretch coming up here. They're 3-5. and five. They go to Tennessee, host the Raiders, at Panthers, then. So if you figure, with the way that they've been playing, they probably go 1-2, and two, maybe 2-1 two and one there. They got at Ravens, home Chiefs, Cardinals, Rams, and then at Chiefs, uh, home against the Chargers. I mean, they got a tough schedule. It's going to be a struggle for them to finish 500. 
Yeah, it, I, you just you said it. I mean, some of these teams in terms of who they still have to play is going to be tough. Uh, some of the teams in terms of they just haven't put it together. You know, both of those teams, the Raiders, it doesn't make sense based on adding Devontae Adams to uh, a team that was in the playoffs one year ago. The coaching matters, though, obviously. They fought for the interim head coach last year. They played a pretty solid brand of football. They moved on for him to McDaniels, and it hasn't looked great. Uh, the Broncos, Russ just looks like he's kind of run out of gas, so to speak. Or, And maybe that's not fair to him. Maybe it's just that he does not fit this offense uh, in terms of his, his skill set compared to what uh, Hackett is trying to do there. So whatever reason, things aren't clicking there, and I'm not sure it will at this point this season. They might need a head coaching change in Denver to find someone that can uh, play to Russ's strengths maybe in 2023. Uh, to be maybe contend in that AFC for a playoff spot. Uh, let me uh, throw out a little bit of a hot take. Um, and I don't know how much I actually believe in it, but I, it's just something keeps sticking in my head every time I think about the Broncos or the Browns when Deshaun Watson comes back and how awful it looked in the preseason when he was back there. Is there a world we could live in, Ryan Talbot, where, listen, the Browns, Sitting here right now at um, three and five, their next stretch here, it's going to be tough to get to 500 by the time um, Deshaun comes back. They got at the Dolphins this week, which is a game I guess they can win. I mean, I I'm not counting them out of that game, but then it's uh, home against the Bills and then at the Bucks. So listen, if they knock off the Dolphins, they could probably beat the Bucks. And then you're sitting there at, you know, one game under 500. With six games to play and Deshaun Watson coming in at quarterback, they play home against the Texans or on the road against the Texans, on the road against the Bengals, home against the Ravens, and then home against the Saints. Those are two really tough teams. By the commanders on January 1st, could Deshaun Watson be so bad in those four games based on these big expectations? And I'm not sitting here saying that he's not going to be an upgrade over Jacoby Brissett. He probably will be. But he's an upgrade over just Kobe we present. He better be a massive upgrade considering the guaranteed dollars in that contract. And I know he's only getting paid, what is it, one million this year or eight million or whatever that whatever the number is for this season. Then it goes into super contract next year. There could be a little bit of heat happening in Cleveland with that with that deal that he just made. It's gonna be a national story every week if he's bad. Yeah, no, that, that's fair. And you know, you'd think there would be some kind of rust based on the fact that he hasn't played a meaningful game preseason doesn't really count as a meaningful game. Um, you might be going against starters for a series or two, but then you're going against second, third string. And as you mentioned, he didn't necessarily look great during the preseason. So uh, if that contract, or if he doesn't play up to that contract this year, next year, it'll be a huge talking point. The coach, the GM, they will be on the hot seat if that's the case, because uh, they're the ones that said, Hey, you know, let, more so the GM, let's give them all this guaranteed money. Uh, not even, you know, giving themselves any kind of potential outs with the way that they uh, structured that contract. Um, you something right now I'm telling you, you don't want to get out of. And that is a trip to Tops Friendly Markets to check out that uh, carry out cafe. They got you hooked up for game day or any day and uh, for your tailgating spreads whenever you need them. Hot to go, fresh, large cheese and pepperoni pizzas, 14 bucks. Jumbo chicken wing, 10 count, $14. The legendary Tops breakfast pizza. Get yourself a large for $20. Pizza or taco logs, six count, $7.69. Baby back rib sections, $5.99 a pound. Sub sandwiches, wraps, apps, sides, and so much more. Visit topsmarkets.com slash red zone for the complete menu of ready to enjoy fan favorites. He's Ryan Talbot. I'm Matt Perino. What do you say, Ryan? Let's do it again on Friday and preview a football game between the Bills and the Jets. How about a little early? Well, early afternoon action. What are you thinking about that? Love it. Early afternoon, Friday preview show. Looking forward to it. All right, boys and girls. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you on Friday. He's Ryan. I'm Matt. Have a good one, everybody.